much um, for having me this evening, um, for making time in the middle of the week to come out for a, an evening lecture. Um, I hope that the pretty pictures compensate for the dimmed lights and uh, can kind of keep everybody um, engaged. But thank you in advance for your, um, your invitation to be here with you. Uh, thanks to the, the Women's Studies Program and to Professor Canning for inviting me. Um, to talk about the feminist dimensions of this work that I've been doing in community muralism in Philadelphia for the past seven years. But after I um, was invited to, to offer your, your lecture this evening, I realized that I have not really, in all of that time, explicitly considered the feminist dimension of this work. And that kind of took me by surprise when I reflected on that myself, that in all of my writing on this, I've not really examined um, the mural movement in Philadelphia um, as a feminist. And I'd like to think that perhaps it's just because a feminist theological sensibility just kind of pervades everything I do, but that might not necessarily be the case. So it's a really great opportunity um, to think more explicitly and publicly with you about that feminist dimension um, of my research. So I'm gonna just cut right to the chase for the sake of time, get right to my thesis. Um, and move through um, some different points so that we can hopefully get to some conversation afterwards um, this evening. So here's my central thesis for tonight that I want to uh, explore with you. Community muralism in Philadelphia, the brainchild of a white female muralist, but fueled largely over the past 25 years by communities of women in largely underprivileged neighborhoods in the city of Philadelphia, provide visual examples of feminist ways of doing ethics, and more importantly, an inspiring, accessible, and effective way of doing justice that I'm going to argue is distinctively feminist. So I'm gonna unpack that thesis in three steps. After giving you a little bit of background about the community muralism movement in Philadelphia, I wanna tell you a little bit about why I find this art so fascinating and compelling as a feminist ethicist. And then I'll lay out a few ways in which muralism really illuminates the components of a feminist approach to Christian ethics, and how these approaches are essential for developing a notion of justice that speaks out of and attends to the particular circumstances of women, particularly poor women in our metro areas in this country. And I'll conclude with a few, a few thoughts about what new questions this public art is raising for me as a feminist ethicist, the way it's propelled me into some new theological questions. And I'll use images throughout to visualize these ideas, since in the end it's the images that gave rise to all of my thinking about this in the first place. So let me begin with a little bit of background about community muralism in Philadelphia. Philadelphia's cultural status as the mural capital of the world, and it is the mural capital of the world, began 27 years ago um, thanks to the city's mural arts program, which started in the early 80s as an anti-graffiti initiative that sought to offer amnesty to graffiti taggers who were willing to paint over their tags with images they learned how to paint in after-school muralism programs. All of this was sponsored by the mayor's office at the time. The painting was, in, it was contagious, and soon whole neighborhoods were getting in on the act <coughs> using the canvases of walls in front of open lots. And here's another one in front of an open lot. In prison yards. On overpasses. parking lots, warehouses, and halfway houses in order to bring beauty into communities. Muralism has since evolved in Philadelphia from simply painting some aspect of the community's cultural identity, which is sort of how the mural started in the, early, um, in the late 80s and early 90s, to working with communities to expand their self-identity by putting them in dialogue with other communities, 
to engaging particular issues impacting the city in the context of murals. And finally, to incorporating other artistic media into the wall painting. So this wall painting incorporates mosaic tiling um, and reliefs. And here's another great example of a relief. It's kind of hidden. I've got this fun little red button I can push and show you. There's a, a relief kind of that's hidden back here, a sort of Aztec wheel of life. Um, they also incorporate, and this is a new, a new dimension, oral history projects that are projected, um, transmitted, that people can pick up on radio stations they drive by the murals in different neighborhoods and listen to the stories of the people depicted um, in, the, in the mural. However, in its 27 years in Philadelphia, the Mural Arts Program has not strayed from its roots and continues to work with marginalized populations throughout the city, most notably at-risk youth and folks in neighborhoods dealing with the structural violence of concentrated poverty. These are the communities that the Mural Arts Program intentionally serves. Unlike traditional forms of public art that are often commissioned by private interests or civic authorities with very little connection to the heavily traveled public spaces in which they are exhibited, community murals arise from the everyday experiences of largely unheard populations and are commissioned by persons with little access to institutional art or opportunities to contribute to cultural definitions of beauty. This art, that this art is displayed on concrete canvases in places dislocated from the common good is not a coincidence, but often the very condition for unleashing their transformative power and their prophetic content on inner city and suburban residents alike. Since the memories, emotions, and imaginations of community members are the muse and material for the art, these persons become, to the, become the privileged insiders and the experts who explain the significance of their murals to the wider society. This aesthetic preferential option for the poor, which is what I think is really going on here, as well as the relationship building process of community muralism, empowers people whose capacity for imaginative expression and creativity has been diminished by concentrated poverty, and who have been misrepresented in the arts or deny meaningful access to humanly made or natural beauty. So in its very um, mission, we can see that there are elements of justice connected um, to, the, to the work of mural making. So let me tell you a little bit about the process of how this unfolds. Community mural making is an elaborate process that creates meaningful relationships as well as spectacular art. And most of the people who are involved in it will tell you that it's the relationships that are the beautiful thing. The art is just um, icing on the cake in some ways. It begins when representatives from a community submit an application to the mural arts program. In addition to identifying a potential wall and a tentative theme, they must secure 30 signatures of neighbors who agree to participate in the process. The Mural Arts Program, a clearinghouse of more than 200 muralists now, many of them coming from outside of the United States, as well as um, a clearinghouse for public and private funding for the arts, then identifies a muralist whose personal and artistic sensibilities seem to be the right fit for the community. The muralists and community members come together for at least three meetings, where at least 12 people must be present. So you can see there's an intention to building community through this process. In some cases, these meetings gather together disparate members of civil society who imagine, design, and paint together. So, for example, police officers and inner city youth come together in this process. Muslims, Christians, and Jews. And another example. Recent immigrants from West Africa and their new African-American neighbors. incarcerated felons and victims of crime. Evangelical Christians and ex-offenders. Delinquent juveniles and neighbors impacted by crime. Inner city teens and white suburban adults, another example. So the muralist listens to the community members and integrates their collective imaginings into a design 
and it requires a consensus by the community before anybody will pick up a paintbrush. So unless there's consensus around the image, the project won't move forward and often the muralist is sent back to the drawing board by the, by the community um, to, to determine, um, to come up with the, the, the image that really captures what they're talking about. This is an example of a community, uh, community meeting taking place inside Greaterford Prison, which is the largest maximum security prison in this Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So you've got folks who are involved, are um, in, incarcerated and in different stages of the of criminal justice system, also contributing to this process. So after this meeting and after the design is settled on, the artist creates a paint by number matrix on six by four sheets of parachute paper, which is a super absorbent kind of paper, almost like a dryer sheet. And then these are eventually adhered to the wall once painting is completed. Um, so folks engage in a kind of paint by number um, process at multiple locations. So you can have people in different parts of the city working on the same, on the same project. And here's a, of a mural going up. You can see the muralists here on the scaffolding kind of doing some final touches and here he is doing some kind of close-up work. So through these community meetings, painting days, and dedication ceremonies, the grassroots process of mural making gradually weaves back together communities that are torn apart by unemployment, violence, poverty, mass incarceration, and addiction. Just a few of the social problems facing folks in our cities today. Furthermore, by pulling in various groups that make up civil society into this creative process, the police department, the Department of Corrections, healthcare providers, the school district, faith-based organizations, so social service agencies, murals help create what I like to call a common beauty, akin to the notion of the common good that's both artistic and deeply relational. Murals reclaim literal and figurative spaces in the midst of the neighborhood for people to come together to identify, express, and remember their communal identity. Painted walls transform otherwise mundane urban places into what Martin Marty calls story spaces. Spaces that define binary ways of thinking that often sustain concentrated poverty and instead transform these neighborhoods um, by making something that seems incredibly familiar to people somewhat unfamiliar through artistic expression. And engaging the complexities of history told from different perspectives or the ambiguity that comes from multiple interpretations of the same event or person, iconic person in the neighborhood, or the incorporating insights of emotion or creative intuition. I focus on murals that are created by faith um, faith-based communities, um, churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, and there's lots of examples, and that's what the book that I just finished and came out in the summer really looks at, faith-based um, faith murals or murals that are done with religious organizations, and here's just a few examples of some, some of them. The Mural Arts Program receives about 300 applications a year for murals, and 25% of them come from faith-based organizations real desire on the part of faith communities throughout the city to participate in this creative mural making process. So returning to the theme of my presentation and the focal point of the remainder of it, um, I think that murals tell us something about justice or how we can go about living in right relationship with each other and that they do this in a distinctively feminist key. So that's what I'd like to talk about now for the remainder of our time. So why do I find murals fascinating as a feminist ethicist? Why am I drawn to these as a feminist? I've got a couple ideas maybe to share with you. Um, and again, it's because you gave me the opportunity to reflect on this, and I really do appreciate that. First and foremost, I think murals serve as unexpected sites of theology. Physical and emotional spaces where people are working out the significance of belief in their daily lives. I think there is a lot of God talk definition of what theology is. Theology is just God talk. And I think there's a lot of God talk happening in here, and I've learned all sorts of new, new things about the divine through engaging um, in this art and talking to people who are involved in making it. Ideas about forgiveness, ideas about celebration, 
ideas about the ways in which people experience God's tender or aggressive presence, depending on what's going on for them in their lives, a God of resilience, and also, I think, in short, a God of mystery, um, and a notion of mystery that's explored in a book one of my colleagues um, has written in, the, in recent history, Beth Johnson, uh, leading feminist theologian, has a book called The Quest for the Living God. And in that book, she really t talks about the notion of God that both transcends any sense that we might have of who or what God is. And I think the fact that we have uh, just the sheer number of murals that speak in some way to the divine indicate the sense that God is larger than any one community's particular understanding or articulation of it. But also that it's, uh, this is a God that's very imminent in people's lives, very present in people's lives. And I think this image really captures that pretty nicely. Um, and the fact that these images articulate notions of the divine, but do so right in the middle of neighborhoods, right in the middle of the block, or right on the corner, or right on the wall of the school um, in the neighborhood, kind of talks about people's sense of God being very present in their lives. And lastly, that God really can only be best expressed symbolically. And so I think to that extent, the murals are doing a tremendous job in inviting people to think through um, different symbolic representations of God. Second, and to put it pretty bluntly, I'm drawn to this art because this is not your average, traditional, normative, i.e. masculine way of doing ethics. Engaging these images and the people who have created them has moved me beyond the traditional purview of academic theology, but still tend to be very much controlled by masculine frameworks of meaning, masculine ways of knowing, and masculine methods of moral reflection. So let me say a quick word about murals are not about what murals do not do as a way of setting up why I think they, are in, they represent an inherently feminist way of doing ethics. I'm attracted to community muralism as a feminist because like any good expression of art, Muralism refuses to fit into neat binary categories that arise from a dualist way of understanding the self, others, or the world. And feminist theologian Rosemary Radford Ruther has named this dualistic way of thinking, way of knowing, way of perceiving, as the lasting inheritance of patriarchy. Those are her words. So in other words, precisely as an expression of art, as an, an expression of art, muralism refuses to cave to traditional divisions that Ruther identifies as critical for maintaining a status quo, and a status quo that she still sees very much controlled by patriarchy. And those could be divisions within the self, such as the mind versus the body, or the intellect versus the emotions, or divisions between the self and others, men and women, black and white, rich and poor, or, Ruther goes on to say, even between humanity and the earth. And that these, and it transcends these divisions which tend to have worked in such a way to benefit those who have been in position of power and who are still in position of power, which I think we would have to agree continues to be met in our day and age. Rather, because they operate in the mode of the symbolic, murals invite multi-perspectivalism. They invite contradiction. They invite ambiguity. Char characteristics that in many ways are that more accurately capture the messiness of the human condition uh, than the more neat, predictable, and therefore controllable divisions that arise from a black and white binary way of thinking or perceiving or knowing. Similarly, the murals are not a product of purely abstract or conceptual thinking. People who create them and people who visit them are not obsessed with logical or rational objectivity or at arriving at universal truths through some kind of process of deductive reasoning. Rather, murals invite a different approach to knowledge, one that is inductive, collaborative, contextual, tactile, and conflictual. Again, these attributes strike many ethicists as being closer to our day-to-day -day ways of knowing ourselves and and finally, in order to make a good mural, you've got to have a different approach to perceiving, evaluating, and responding to the world. One that is shot through with a creative impulse characterized by reasoning with contradiction, reasoning with ambiguity, reasoning with subjectivity, not reasoning that excludes or denies these things. 
So murals use the senses, they use imagination, they use memory, they rely on fantasy, all elements that have long been overlooked, if not flat out rejected by more masculine methods of moral reasoning. And then finally, finally, I'm captivated by these larger than life images as a feminist because I see them as sites of hope. And I don't mean optimism that is blind to the complex demands of reality and futilely attempts to sidestep the urgent demands of reality with a kind of wishful thinking that simply longs for some aspect of the past to materialize again in the future. That's not what I see happening in murals. That's not the hope I see in murals. No, murals are expressions of hope, what Christian feminist writer Anne Lamont calls, and I quote you here because I think it's a beautiful phrase, ribbons of fresh air in tight, scary rooms. In this case, the tight, scary rooms of urban poverty sealed shut from the fresh air of the common good by generations of economic marginalization. These pinpoints of riotous color throughout the city of Philadelphia are buildings, overpasses, retaining walls, all 3,500 of them, defiantly proclaim and without words that creativity is a powerful force when it is unleashed by communities and with the good of the wider public in mind. To use the words, the words of feminist theorist Grace Jansen, murals are figuratively and literally, and here's her expression, reconfiguring the consciousness reconfiguring the consciousness of people, in this case, the people of the city of Philadelphia, into what she calls a creativity, a sense of creativity and new life. Murals are making people think that new things are possible in places where no one ever thinks anything good or new is possible. And I don't underestimate the remarkable power of that sense of new. Okay, so let me identify a couple components of a feminist approach to justice that I see coming out of the murals and give you a couple of examples of images and some stories um, to go along with them um, to think through notions of, of justice and how I think the murals are captivating components of a distinctively feminist approach to justice. Okay, so disclaimer, here comes the only other slide aside from my title slide with text. I apologize for text, but there's a definition of justice I want to throw up here for you because this has been the one I have found to be in the back of my mind as I was preparing my remarks for you tonight. And so I figured, why not share it with you outright so you can sort of see what's shaping my own thinking. This is a notion of justice that comes from Margaret Farley. She's a feminist ethicist, a Catholic feminist, who teaches at Yale University um, in their school of theology there. And this is how she has defined justice in her most recent book, a book on sexual ethics, but an attempt to say sexual ethics is also inherently a social ethic. And so she defines justice this way, persons and groups of persons ought to be affirmed according to their concrete reality, actual and potential. That's the way that a leading feminist, Catholic feminist right now is thinking about justice. And so I wanna say, hmm, I like that definition because I see some of this definition being worked out in, in Philly. So let me just give you, I'm gonna give you a couple key ways that I think that this is being worked out, okay, this notion of justice. So the first is to talk about experience. Women's joys and sorrows, women's shared experiences of the everyday, women's experience of the life of the community are always the optimal starting point for feminist ethical reflection. Feminists start with experience. Margaret Farley, in a different book, defines experience this way, and I think it's helpful. The actual living of events and relationships, along with the sensations, feelings, emotions, insights, and understandings that are all part of this lived reality. That's the way she understands experience. So thinking about or starting with experience greatly expands the parameters of what ought to concern ethicists and also what ethicists might use to do our work. And attention to the various lived experiences taking up and taken up in muralism underscores this point. Home life, memories of the past, celebrations of community leaders, or memorials to the community's dead,
can in some ways point us to what Eurista ethicist, a Latina ethicist, Ada Maria Asasa Diaz, who taught at Drew University and just passed away a year ago, called the moral insights of everyday experiences in la lucha, or in the struggle for justice that shapes the day in and day out experiences of folks in neighborhoods where murals are created. The struggle lends an urgency to the work that muralists and community members are doing and also a kind of brilliance to the small but notable victories these folks achieve. Spirits that refuse to be broken, cultural traditions that will not be relinquished, voices that refuse to go silent but merely transition into visual proclamations like this one. This image Born Again, painted by Cliff Eubanks in 2000 and refurbished again in 2006, captures this fundamental feminist sensibility about experience. Women in the Southwest Philadelphia neighborhood where it stands commissioned Eubanks to paint an image of hope, an image that captured the daily work of mothers and grandmothers in raising their children in this neighborhood. This is both a rising and a setting sun because the image is about death and rebirth told me when I interviewed him back in 2007. There is hope, there is future. The child is much like the sunrise. This is what you want your child to grow into. Someone of power, someone who can rise above what's happening in the neighborhood. Eubank's comments here underscore an even more fundamental dimension of feminist theology when it comes to the experience that community murals offer. Mural making provides an important personal and interpersonal process and public space for reflecting on experience in a way that brings forward what womanist ethicist Terry Day calls a dimension of transcendence. Day, an African American ethicist, believes that transcendence is a most urgent need, particularly for poor black women who face, and I'm gonna quote her, the most hostile and venomous cultural attacks as diverse societal institutions blame them for their poverty. Muralism taps into various dimensions of women's experience, but with the intent of making at once deeply personal, but profoundly public meaning out of them. So Day would say that the importance that, for example, the black church offers black women is the ability to make sense out of their experiences of themselves. The ability to make meaning, to make sense, is a fundamental need she sees, and I see that murals are giving rise to this. So the way that Day talks about transcendence, and this is in a book called Unfinished Business, Black Women, the Black Church, and the Struggle to Thrive in America. Day says, transcendence is the openness of women, particularly poor black women, to ultimate value in the world, which enables them to act as agents and to make meaning despite debilitating, inhumane socioeconomic conditions. So, and a focus on experience and then the ability to make meaning of experience, the opportunity for transcendence. So that's one thing I think that we can see um, in the murals. The second thing has to do with anthropology. Feminist ethicists understand the person as an autonomous being who realizes autonomy and the flourishing that comes with autonomy in and through relationships. And I think that's really captured nicely in this piece. And if I had seen this piece before, I would have made this be the cover of my book because I love this image so much. I really do think it captures in some ways what feminists are talking about in terms of what Lisa Cahill, for example, calls an embodied sociality. That this is an embodied and relational approach to autonomy that relies, Cahill says, on equality, compassion, and solidarity that quality, compassion, and solidarity are the fundamentals of human flourishing and that we only experience those things in relationship with other people. Moreover, feminist ethicists assert a non-negotiability on the insistence that the centrality, uh, on the centrality of the body as a source of experience and expression of the self, right? That the body is absolutely essential. Margaret Farley explains this in terms of embodied spirits and in spirited bodies, or the fact that somehow we know that the bodies that we have, and I'm quoting her, the bodies we have are also the bodies we are. My body is fundamental to myself because it is in only in and through my body that I experience myself. 
or that I experience others, or that I experience the world. Bodily senses give us important information when it comes to justice, information that's often sidelined in more objective or theoretical approaches, but is absolutely central um, to creativity. Sound and touch and taste are as critical as sight um, in, our un in trying to understand our social reality and come up with responses to broken, uh, broken systems. Feminists also understand that the body is a site for injustice, something that high rates of violence against women or the trafficking of women's bodies tragically demonstrates, but they also confidently recognize that bodies are sites where justice happens. And in the case of neural making, we're talking about bodies bumping up against each other as they paint together an image that arises when people allow their minds to bump up against one another too. So bodies are very, very central here um, in thinking through uh, feminist approaches. Community is a third piece. I think that's really important when we start to talk about a feminist approach to justice. Feminist ethicists, particularly Catholic ones, underscore an awareness that individuals only flourish while nested in healthy relationships within equally flourishing families, blocks, neighborhoods, and cities. We cannot become our best selves simply as autonomous individuals. This component of feminist ethics is captured in this image called Steppers, painted on the exterior wall of what used to be the rectory of St. Elizabeth's Church in the Ridge Avenue neighborhood of North Philadelphia. The Archdiocese of Philadelphia closed and eventually demolished St. Elizabeth's Church that stood on the empty lot the mural now faces back in the late 80s, just as the side effects of the post-industrial boom in manufacturing centers like Philadelphia were being most acutely felt felt in terms of the loss of jobs, felt in terms of the decline in the housing stock and home ownership, felt in terms of closing public schools, felt in terms of spikes in crime and street violence. Although this image, which captures the social anchors of the neighborhood that continue to hold it together despite the retreat of Catholic and public social services, the image could certainly be read through a prophetic lens, right, that the people are decrying the archdiocese motivations for closing the parish or even a liberationist lens, the community itself, you know, calling attention to the fact that the community itself and not the absent social services is what is the sustaining life force in this community. Again, I think Harry Day's notion of transcendence comes more clearly to mind here, particularly in light of the fact that even within religious communities like St. Elizabeth's Parish, an undertow of patriarchy keeps women's experiences from being taken up by the community. Here we see an image that conveys a very clear message. We need each other, and not necessarily institutions of the, of the dominant culture, to flourish. We need each other, and not necessarily our religious or political leaders to make sense of our reality. We need each other to march resolutely forward toward a future that remains for us largely unknown. At a fundamental level, murals remind us that the basic task of ethics is to try to make meaning out of complex or unintelligible situations or circumstances, many of them facing the folks in the St. Elizabeth's or St. E's neighborhood, as it's called. Um, I think we can also see this emphasis on community illustrated in this image called Recovery, um, a mosaic of images on the side of New Jerusalem now a very countercultural recovery, substance abuse recovery program and residence in the heart of North Philadelphia, whose founder, Sister Margaret McKenna, a medical mission sister, explains their mission not so much as a, what she would call a social service institution, but rather, and I'm gonna quote her here, a community of people helping ourselves and our neighborhood to recover. The 12 images of recovery from addiction depicted here are meaningful not only to the individuals who created them, but also to the intentional communities of neighbors that have grown up around the New Jerusalem Now enclave, and also who share their deep commitment to sobriety. Murals underscore the symbiotic relationship between the self and the group when it comes to transcendence, the sense that a fundamental part of being human is freedom to constantly become who you sense yourself to be, but that that process does not happen in a vacuum, but requires deep relationality with others in order to be able to better tap into the deep reserves of your own relationship with yourself. 
and I'm going to quote Sister Margaret here because I think this is a really prophetic line. Community gives people feedback about who they are and the chance to observe that they have things to contribute. In community, we learn that justice in our own lives becomes the framework for justice in the world. I want to say a thing or two also about emotion, right, and the role of emotion in justice and theories of justice and approaches to justice. I think murals are providing a conduit for privileging the often underappreciated aspects of cognition or what some people have called women's ways of knowing, such as imagination, memory, the body, senses, intuition. The classic dichotomy between mind and body that pervaded much of secular and religious ethics for the vast majority of the history of these disciplines downplayed, if not dismissed, the wisdom of the, of the, wisdom of the body and emotions outright. But feminist political philosopher Martha Nussbaum, who was very influential for me in thinking through compassion um, not too long ago, has done an awful lot to expose the errors in the tendency to dismiss emotions. And she works to make emotional cognition fundamental to moral thinking. Nussbaum says that emotions provide important upheavals, that's the word she uses, upheavals in conventional thinking. They call our attention to things we might otherwise miss, they evoke meaningful responses, and they motivate action. In fact, Nussbaum suggests compassion as the most pivotal emotive cognition, or emotive cognitive process, excuse me, the most pivotal emotive cognitive process for social change. Since through compassion, we exercise underdeveloped moral muscles, such as imagination, a willingness to risk vulnerability, a commitment to making other people's sufferings important to me. Nussbaum could find no better partner, I think, for her efforts in that regard than community muralism, particularly in light of the power of these images to communicate lament. This is a big theological word, lament. It's one of the most ancient forms of emotive expression. In Christian and Jewish sacred texts, laments are public expressions of acute pain, the groaning of the Israelites under the yoke of slavery in Egypt, the cries of the sick who called out to Jesus to be healed, the wailings of the women in Jerusalem and the passion narratives. All of this is an expression of pain which stems from an acute sense that the pain and suffering need not be. So laments are public demands that something be done, to recognize that things, something is fundamentally wrong that something ought to be done. And I think murals are offering a way of cultivating the moral agency that comes with lamenting. Laments are a form of moral agency. Um, and they're important, in a, particularly in a culture like ours that prefers intellect rather than emotion, that a per prefers logic rather than fantasy, that prefers deductive rather than inductive reasoning, that prefers objectivity rather than the raw subjectivity of lament. So I think we see this form of emotive um, moral agency in the, in the images that I've been showing you from the Families Are Victims too, which is a massive mural that wraps around a SEPTA bus terminal, a public transportation, or public transportation bus terminal um, that was commissioned by a neighborhood network um, of family members in Southwest Philadelphia who have lost loved ones to gun violence. And the name of the organization is called the Families Are Victims too. This visual lament calls attention to the stark contrast between the way things are, with gun violence claiming the lives of far too many people in urban communities, and the way things might be, with the possibility for peace and safe neighborhoods where parents celebrate life with their children rather than memorialize them. Laments summon the wider community to take seriously the suffering these folks experience and to do something about it. It's the raw content, the raw emotive content of laments that makes them really difficult to explain away or to domesticate them anyway. A rawness that the muralist who painted this, this mural, Barbara Smolin, interestingly enough, a Jewish muralist, tried to capture that sense of lament using a contemporary take on the Pieta, right? And also with the images, the mourning angels, um, throughout the piece, whose faces are mothers in the neighborhood, and the stark contrast between the black and white 
uh, portraits of different people in the neighborhood who had died and, the, and these rich flowers with these very deep hues. Okay, one more thing I want to share with you here about feminist dimensions of justice, uh, and that's this notion of storytelling. And storytelling being a fundamental component of, of justice from a feminist perspective. Murals provide a visual example of storytelling. They're visual stories, right? They're telling visuals in a story, in a, in, or telling stories in a visual context. And this emphasis on story making or storytelling in ethics and in justice is a unique contribution of womanist ethicists, of black ethicists, American ethicists. Most notable among them is Katie Cannon. Uh, who argues that in black culture, storytelling in formal and informal ways has long served as a source of moral wisdom. She calls it, and I quote, an underground treasury below the, perver the perversions of ethics and morality imposed on women of color by whites and males who support racial imperialism in a patriarchal social order, end quote. Right? So that stories and storytelling are an underground treasury of wisdom and resources. Storytelling provides, again, another expression of moral agency. Just as lament was an expression of moral agency, we can see storytelling as a form of moral agency that names and passes along the tradition of, um, the tradition of li lived wisdom accumulated over generations. The wisdom of stories is not only about how to survive the injustices of racism, and patriarchy, but also how to claim the uniqueness of one's own identity and the gifts of one's own community. Ingenuity, resourcefulness, celebratory spirit, resilience, the list could go on. Storytelling can cut the myths, cut through the myths, expose the untruthfulness of the myths that legitimize the experience of the dominant culture as normative. The power of stories of people of color to expose the lies and the amnesia and the stories of the dominant culture, I think, is powerfully captured in this mural called Lincoln's Legacy, which is just nine blocks from Independence Hall. I don't know if anybody's been, has anybody been to Independence Hall in Philadelphia, to the place where they signed the Declaration of Independence? So this is just a few short blocks away, right, um, from Independence Hall. And the story about this about this mural, um, it was paid for or financed by Lincoln Financial, which is a big uh, banking um, a big banking firm in Philadelphia. The, the Eagles play in Lincoln Financial Field, and Lincoln Financial wanted to do a mural, a, a citywide mural on on Lincoln. And so the mural arts program worked with the school department to cult to create a curriculum. Um, around Lincoln, and then after they worked through some of the curriculum to meet with students, um, and they brought students to the national, a whole bunch of students from different schools in the public school system to the Constitution Center to sort of do this brainstorming process around the image of, um, around an, an, a, 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 a mural that would be a tribute to Lincoln. And I think the fascinating thing that results from this is, I don't know if you can see, but Lincoln plays, he's not even as big as one of these SUVs right there, here is Lincoln, a really, really small component of the larger image, right? And so in the stories, both with kids in the school and other um, citizens in Philadelphia, again, this was a, a very long and public process. It was, it was an attempt to have it be a community-wide, a city-wide mural. The realization sort of came that Lincoln's legacy really had absolutely nothing to do with Lincoln at all, but had everything to do with the resilience of the African-American community in the United States from the period of uh, slavery through the present day, right? And so that the mural really is actually trying to call attention to a very tortured and dark history in the United States, which we very conveniently um, forget most of the time, and downplay, particularly in light of the fact that at the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the decision um, to free slaves was rejected for the sake of arriving at some kind of compromise uh, among the colonies, right? So this is, um, a, this is a story, this is a, a story that is coming um, out of the experience of um, a particular community in the American experience 
that runs quite counter to uh, the dominant myth of American freedom um, and American liberty and American values that were formed a few blocks away uh, at Independence Hall. Right, so this is a really powerful testament. And the other thing I would point out is this whole half of the mural is done in Venetian tiles. So the students in the schools um, worked to set these tiles um, in these small little trays, and then they were they were adhered to the wall. So again, a really a really um, a really telling telling image. Maybe the last thing, really quick, last thing I'll say, and I'll make a couple brief things about where this is taking me, and then we can open it up to conversation. I also think that we see um, examples of how to navigate difference um, that are coming out of a, that feminists, um, precisely because they were the first to articulate the importance of gender difference when it comes to ethics, have also had to wrestle then with um, the ongoing, uh, sometimes thorny issue of difference and how to how to navigate difference. Um, and so feminists of color, womanists, Mubarisa and Asian feminists are often remind us regularly, like regularly remind those of us in the dominant Euro-American culture that we have to be really careful when it comes to speaking of women's experience, particularly in light of the Christian tradition's long history of cultural imperialism. Um, and so I think that the murals are doing a really great job in maintaining a rich appreciation for difference. Um, and that, that appreciation for difference is absolutely critical in our increasingly multicultural cities. Um, if we want to get a sense of justice that is robust and something that appeals to all people. So I think muralism is offering the citizens of Philadelphia effective ways of avoiding painting others with either a broad brush stroke that denies difference or with a single brush that um, essentializes and I think this image here is a, is a good example of that. This is um, an um, Islamic community center in um, North Philadelphia. It's been in that neighborhood for 40 years in an old furniture warehouse. And shortly after 9-11, they decided that they wanted to really kind of go public with their presence in the neighborhood and went through an extreme makeover um, and redid the entire external um, facade of the building. And the interesting thing is that the painting was done, the mural project was done by a Jewish muralist and a, and a Christian muralist, a Catholic muralist. And so it was a very elaborate and deliberate process of trust building for the folks within the mosque who represent 13 different countries, 250 families from 13 different countries, so a very robust understanding even of Islam within this mosque. Um, but then to work um, with Joe Bremen, who is a Jew, Kathleen uh, Hughes, who is the other muralist, who's a Catholic, and then this is a dog, Ibrahim, who was the, the point person at the mosque. Right? And these three people work together to really completely renovate um, this building. So there's a picture of Joe kind of doing some of the painting. Um, and the, the building is decorated with all sorts of elaborate tiles that were made during painting days in the neighborhood um, that were opened up to kids in the neighborhood from some of the different schools. A Catholic school came into the mosque, a Jewish synagogue from up in the up in the suburbs came into the mosque to do painting days. So a very elaborate sort of way of thinking through how to navigate difference, an appreciation for difference, a willingness to engage in difference in, in meaningful ways. Um, okay, so all of that said, I just wanted to maybe offer you a couple questions of where I think some new, some new questions that this art is raising for me. Um, and I'll just say a couple things about that as some of these pictures, um, some of these pictures pop up. So I just want to say three quick things and then we'll have some time for a conversation. I think that muralism is an important contribution to public discourse. That we can recognize that we're having a real problem with public discourse in our, in our country right now, we're having a really hard time engaging each other in meaningful ways. And that public art in public spaces can become a very effective conduit for meaningful engagement among persons, different kinds of persons, persons with different ideas, persons with different cultural identities, different um, religious backgrounds. So in some ways, I see the impetus behind mural sort of say less, create more in our public discourse, in our way um, of engaging one another. So I think that that is something that I'm, 
I really like. And this mural, I think, captures that really nicely. Um, this, I don't know if you, you can probably make out this American flag here in the middle, but when you're standing in front of the mural, you can't see it. It's only until like, you look at it through your camera or you take a picture of it that the flag kind of jumps out. But it's really um, an interfaith mural painted by truant kids in the Philadelphia schools. This school system is sort of talking about the ways in which spirituality, all spiritualities can be a form of enlightenment. But again, this idea of can't we shape our public discourse by saying less, perhaps doing more in creative ways. Create more, say less, create more. Um, the second thing, and this is really critically important, and I think this is where my, my research is taking me. I see this art making me increasingly aware of just how white an ethicist I am. And if you remember at the beginning I said that I'm drawn to this art because it's not a masculine way of doing ethics or thinking about justice. Well, I think I'm also drawn now increasingly to this art because it is showing me um, ways that I can be attentive to the whiteness in my feminism and just how much my own sensibilities are shaped by my white identity. And it's difficult um, for whites to own our white identity in this cultural reality because our, our identity is the normative identity. Our experience is the normative experience. Our, our culture is the normative culture. Um, and so it's raised, it, it surfaced some questions for me. Um, I want to know why it is that my field, Christian ethics, rarely takes up any kind of ethical reflection or action having to do with the arts. Why ethnography is a source that is sort of viewed very suspiciously in my, in my field. Um, I don't want to let go of the uncomfortable and feeling that arises within me when I acknowledge my own power up here behind this podium in shaping the way that folks like you engage these images, right? I'm here, the muralists are not. I'm here, the community members are not. Um, and so I want to continue to be troubled by that because I think there's an, there are important insights um, to be lifted out by that. I also want to know why it is that white communities don't have murals. They attempted to do a mural in Philly in one of the wealthiest neighborhoods of the city, Rittenhouse Square, and it fell apart because the neighbors could not agree. The white folks could not agree on an image, and so the mural, mural arts program walked away. They walked away because the white folks couldn't come reach consensus. What is that about? Why does that happen? Um, is it because we don't have stories or emotions, desires? I don't think so, but I think it's that we're so entrenched in a dominant culture that pre precludes creative expression or communal identity, and I want to explore more of that, and that's where my, my work is taking me. Um, and then I think the last thing I would want to say, oh sorry, this image, this is the, this is the white lady looking out um, in this really great mural called um, All Join Hands, which is done on the side of Benjamin Franklin High School um, at a really big intersection right in Center City. Um, and then I think the last thing is that this, this work has shown me the importance of community organizing for ethics, um, for people who do ethics entering into relationships of mutuality and reciprocity with folks at the margins of our communities really assists us, can assist us in ethics, both in decentering the center, but then also in the, our own much needed process of centering, determining why it is that we do what it is that we do, defining for ourselves our own goalposts for, for success, figuring out what we stand for, and standing there. Those are the fundamentals of community organizing. Those are the things that folks who are engaged in community organizing work out before they commit themselves to whatever justice issue it is that they're going to take up. And I think that there's some real um, wisdom there. Womanist ethicist Tracy West notes, and I want to quote her and then I'll, I'll end. Communities, um, community sources can hold accountable the ideas of dominant thinkers and traditions, ensuring that those dominant ideas are useful for the common good, that the dominant ideas are useful for everyone. And so it's really, uh, I think in some ways, an invitation to what another feminist ethicist calls an ethic of risk, right? Not an ethics that tries to control and understand uh, and maintain the status quo, but something that wants to risk something very, very new. Um, and so I do think that the, my, the sense that, or that my own uh, move towards wanting to look at uh, critical race theory and my own wanting to explore white culture um, in Catholic uh, higher education is a direct result of the work that I um, was able to observe and in some ways participated in the community.
So thank you very much for your attention. I realize I, I unloaded an awful lot on all of you. I appreciate your, your being here, and I'm really eager to hear um, some questions that you, that you might have. I thought you said 13,000? No, 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 sorry, 3,500. Oh, 3,500. 3,500, but to put that in perspective, there are 500 murals, community murals in New York City. There are 3,500 in Philly. So they're really, they're almost running out of walls yeah. in Philadelphia. They're, they're, they're everywhere. Yeah, so I'm saying that murals are murals as a whole are representing a very inherently, or I see some in, implicitly and in some places explicit sort of feminist way of doing ethics, right? So that, and this is, you know, uh, feminist, we could say that feminist theology and feminist ethics might be 40 years old, maybe, and these murals kind of themselves are the mural movement started in the mid 80s. So I'm sort of arguing that they're not necessarily a masculine way of doing ethics. That makes, does that make sense? I was just curious. Were you going to hear a little curious. bit more about that? I was just curious uh, where you get the feel from. No, I'm saying that really, the, there are, I don't know that there are any murals that I would say as sort of being masculine. Right? That okay. I'm saying there is, a, there is a way of doing ethics that has tends to work from sort of a masculine, because so much of ethics and the history of ethics has been done by men, largely Euro-American men. The body of work in ethics, whether secular ethics or religious ethics, is implicitly and in some places explicitly masculine because it's been done by men. And so what I'm arguing for is that this art reflects the sort of sensibilities that have come about in ethics since women have been able to start doing ethics, which is a relatively so yes, most of the images that I showed you, or at least half the images I showed you, were done by men, right? But the method that they're using, the attention to emotion, the emphasis on collaboration, and um, uh, 
about communal deliberation, the sense that we're not going for some kind of objective truth, but we're going to really enhance the subjectivity of what we're doing. All of those have been things that have come into ethics when women have started to be able to do ethics. So that's sort of what I'm, so I'm just sort of saying these are visual examples of a kind of a, a foot that you could lead with in ethics, a feminist foot, as opposed to the more traditional, more historical, still largely dominant way of doing ethics, which is an ethics that has got these more masculine sort of tendencies, ways of reasoning, ways of perceiving the self, ways of perceiving the world. Does that make, does that help? Yes. Okay, yeah, that's good, because that's a big, <laughs> that's a big, big part of what I was trying to put forward to the lab, so I can follow up on that. Yes, uh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, community of mulism, is it anywhere else in the United States outside of Philly? Oh yeah, yeah, so um, there are a lot of cities that have strong mural movements, right? So New York has a very, in fact, muralism in New York predates muralism in Philly. Um, and when I'm talking about community muralism, I'm not talking about the individual person who goes up and kind of on their own, you know, yeah. spray can something or works, you know, to put up a memorial to someone, not to say that those aren't important testimonies in public space, but community muralism is this kind of approach to muralism that's embedded in community organizing. So LA has a really um, a long history of this. In fact, the woman who started the mural movement in Philly, the woman by the name of Jane Golden, went out to LA, went to Stanford, and then was a muralist in LA before she came back to Philly. New York has a really uh, good tradition. Chicago in the 60s had a couple really classic walls. They're not up anymore, because that's the other thing about murals. It's very transitory, right? And they're open to the elements, they're open to development, they're open to buildings you know, um, falling apart. So Chicago has another really good history. Um, but folks are recognizing Philly for a lot of different distinctive reasons, most of them having to do with the, um, the way in which the organization of Philly uses some public funds from the city and private funds from private donors to do intentional work around pop disparate populations in the city, right? So they're very well recognized for the work that they're doing in prisons with incarcerated folks, with ex-offenders, employing um, young kids that are coming out of the prison uh, system or employing ex-offenders as muralists, doing mural work with victims of crimes and perpetrators of crimes in prisons. Um, so they are they are using this art as a as a means of as a means of justice, looking at healthcare issues, looking at disability issues, um, looking at issues of gun violence. So um, I think that's what people are recognizing makes Philly in some ways distinct. So that's a, that's another good follow up question. Yeah. Yes. Suburbs have family connections, history in, 
but in the white flight of you know Philly, which is like the white flight of most other metro areas on the East Coast and even in Chicago, people haven't been back to those neighborhoods. Um, and so it is bringing people in the suburbs back in to the inner city, and there is an opportunity for conversation and dialogue. But you've got, I think, the mural arts program needs to be a bit more intentional about how that happens, and that's where this question of of um, of race starts to come into play, right? So how does how does everybody start to navigate the obvious racial tension that comes up when a whole busload of white people comes in, you know, into an inner city neighborhood, you know, where people say like, "Are you touring the borders? What are you looking for? What are you?" You know, and it's totally understandable. Outsiders coming into your neighborhood as tourists, as opposed to coming in and wanting to learn about what's going on and getting to know folks. So. I feel like there's some missed opportunity there, but at least it is making the divide between the Philly suburbs and the Philly inner city a little bit more perforated, so that there is a little bit more of that movement. Um, yeah, but a lot, a lot more, a lot more to be done. Yeah. Uh, why don't uh, we uh, now go to the reception? Maybe if you have some more individual questions you want to ask uh, uh, Dr. O'Connell. And uh, there's, there's uh, some lovely food over there, some, some treats, and also she has some uh, books. If you're interested in buying her books, then she's fine.